This presentation on hurdle technology and food additives is part of a workshop that was conducted in St. Kitts and Nevis during February of 2016. Because of the length of the topic, I have split it into two parts. Financial support for this workshop from the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, IECA, is gratefully acknowledged. I would like to personally thank Mr. Augustine Merchant, IECA representative in St. Kitts and Nevis, and the IECA staff for their considerable efforts in making this workshop possible. We will begin with a brief introduction followed by an explanation of hurdle technology which will bring us to the end of part one. Part two will begin with a definition of food additives and be followed with the roles of food additives in food processing, approval processes for food additives, and exemptions of food additives, as well as consumer perceptions, legislative complexities, and permitted levels of preservatives. We will finish up with a few summary comments. Food processors have a number of different methods at their disposal to prevent food spoilage and to enhance shelf life. Many of you may have considered these preservation methods in isolation from each other. We will now take a look at a multiple approach to food preservation. Hurdle technology is an approach used to control or eliminate pathogens in food products. It is a relatively new technology originating around 1978 by Dr. Lothar Leisner of the Federal Center for Meat Research in Germany. Multiple methods of reducing microbial growth are used in partnership with one another. The overall concept of hurdle technology is fairly simple. We can compare it to a situation where a runner is taking part in a race. On a flat stretch of track, the runner is unimpeded in his or her dash from the starting line to the finish line. So let's show the starting line here and the finishing line over on the right hand side of the diagram and the runner will have unimpeded progress from the left to the right, that is from the start to the finish. However, the runner's speed and energy will be severely affected if we place a number of hurdles between the starting and finishing lines. So here once again we have the flat terrain with the starting line and the finishing line. However, now we are going to put a series of hurdles between the two points and these hurdles are designed to slow the runner and to reduce some of the energy that the runner has and overall slow him or her down. An expanded list of processing procedures includes thermal processing, dehydration and drying, pH control or acidity modification, water binding or water activity, which is abbreviated to A sub W, chilling and freezing, modified atmosphere packaging or MAP, and food additives, plus a number of others. Jam making is a good example where we can explain the use of hurdle technology. A process flow diagram of the steps in jam making would look something like the diagram on the next slide. Here we see the preparation of raw fruit which is then boiled. Sugar is added and then lemon juice is added to acidify it and the mixture will be returned to the boil. The hot mixture is then poured into sanitized jars which are sealed and inverted. After cooling, the jars can be stored for use or for distribution to the consumers. Now, let's place a system boundary around the core part of the process. Here we see several squares marked in yellow. These are what I would consider to be the critical control points. Certainly bringing the fruit to a boil is part of the thermal process. And the addition of sugar does more than just sweeten the jam. It actually acts as a water binding agent to tie up the water molecules so that they are no longer available for the growth of microorganisms. The addition of lemon juice does more than just change the tartness of the jam. It actually acidifies the mixture so that that will impede the growth of microorganisms. Sealing of the jars prevents the ingress 
of microorganisms after the jam has been prepared. I've also indicated inversion of the jars, but this time in blue. And that is designed to get the hot jam up into the top area or headspace of the jar where there could be some residual microorganisms after the sealing of the jars has taken place. In this way, we have a secondary thermal processing step to rid the headspace of potential contamination by residual microorganisms. Let's consider the hurdles in our jam making process. So we begin by looking at a relatively high initial microbial population. The first hurdle that we're going to insert in the process is the heat treatment step. This will act as a major reduction step for the population of the microorganisms. The second hurdle will be the addition of sugar. The sugar will bind the water after the jam has set, and this will reduce the rate of growth of any microorganisms which happen to survive the heat treatment step. For the third hurdle, we will add an acidulant, typically citric acid in the form of lemon juice concentrate. By lowering the pH or increasing the acidity, we create another hurdle that will prevent or reduce the rate of growth of the microorganisms. A fourth hurdle could be the fact that there is very little to no oxygen present in the jars of jam after they have been sealed. Many microorganisms require oxygen to grow although it should be noted that there are several which can grow in non-oxygenated environments or as we say in anaerobic environments. So that also will reduce the rate of growth. In our home we add a fifth hurdle by freezing the jars of jam. Sufficient headspace must be left to allow for expansion of the frozen jam and this avoids cracking the glass jars. Note in our diagram there are two hurdles that involve physical processing steps. They are the heat treatment and the exclusion of oxygen. Plus there are two hurdles that involve the use of additives. One is the acidification by citric acid and the other is the addition of sugar which acts to bind the water that is present in the jam. Freezing would be a fifth hurdle and it's a physical processing step. The addition of a chemical preservative could be used as a sixth but less desirable hurdle. Additives are a complex topic and rely on chemical interactions to prevent microbial growth. In jam making, consumers may avoid adding lemon juice concentrate as they feel it is unnecessary and will add a lemon flavor to their product. They may also reduce the sugar since they feel that they do not need their product quite that sweet. Both these steps essentially negate the effectiveness of the hurdles imposed by the addition of sugar and the addition of acid and they diminish the product performance. Now let's take a look at water activity. The addition of the proper amount of sugar is critical for successful jam making. The sugar chemically binds the water in the jam and makes it unavailable for the microorganisms to use in their growth. We call this concept water activity or A sub W. A lower water activity or A sub W will create an environment that is unfavorable for microbial growth. If you do not add enough sugar to bind the water in something like jam, the microorganisms will use this free water, that is the unbound water, to support their growth. Additives that lower the water activity include glucose and fructose as well as sucrose. All three of these are sugars. Then we have salts such as sodium chloride, NaCl, which is common table salt, and potassium chloride, KCl, which is another form of salt. There are many others and all of these tend to have a low molecular weight and act as good water binding agents. Drying is different from water binding in that water is physically removed from a product. Microbial growth and most chemical reactions require water. So if water is not present, microbial growth and degradative chemical reactions are essentially halted. 
the addition of acids will lower the pH of the food product to below that where many microorganisms can grow. Typically this might be a pH of 4.5. Acidulants include citric and malic acid, tartaric acid, benzoic acid, lactic acid, propionic acid, and a number of others. Low acid products have a pH above 5.4 and pose a special problem. An example of a low acid product is various varieties of tomatoes whose pH is slightly above 5.4. When canning tomatoes it is important to add an acidulant such as citric acid or vinegar which will lower the pH to below that threshold between low acid and high acid products. In fruit juice based beverages a pH at or below 4.0 is often used since it avoids the growth of molds and matches the pH of the natural juice. Microorganisms may require the presence of oxygen to grow so if we can remove it we can impose another hurdle. Caution is needed however since Clostridium botulinum can grow under these anaerobic conditions. You may wish to use low levels of preservatives for Clostridium botulinum. Benzoate is often used in soft drinks, sulfites are used in wines, and nitrites are used as a preservative in meats. You can also remove oxygen in fruit juice based beverages through the use of vitamin C as an oxygen scavenger and of course vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. You can flush the container headspace with nitrogen gas to displace the air and reduce the oxygen. Nitrogen is inert and is quite harmless so there are no negative effects. You can flush the container headspace with steam to displace the air and reduce the oxygen and when the hot steam cools it will reduce the volume in the headspace and create a slight vacuum in the container. Preservatives have been mentioned elsewhere in this discussion. They include sulfites, nitrites, sorbates, and other preservatives. Other issues may be associated with the use of preservatives and we will talk about some of those in part two of this presentation. There are other methods that are employed as part of the hurdle technology approach. They include competitive exclusion where we have favorable microorganisms growing in such abundant numbers that they choke out the undesirable microorganisms. An example of this is lactic acid bacteria whose large population and production of lactic acid will create an environment unfavorable for certain other microorganisms to grow and an example of this product would be in certain types of yogurts. Storage temperatures will also act as a hurdle. You can select the storage temperature that will slow the rate of microbial growth. Temperatures may be in the range of 4 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius which we consider to be a chilled temperature. Although this slows the rate of growth it does not completely eliminate it. The same can be said for the temperature range from 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius which we associate with refrigerated conditions. This will slow the growth of microorganisms further than the chilled temperatures but they can still grow. It's not until you get below the freezing point of the food product that you end up getting enhanced shelf life of the product. Modified atmospheres create an environment within a package that reduces microbial growth as well as the chemical reactions within that product. An example includes the use of nitrogen gas inside potato chip bags to eliminate the presence of air which is 20% oxygen and may cause oxidative rancidity of the oils used in the production of the potato chips. And nitrogen gas which makes up 78% of the air we breathe is totally harmless in this application. Modified atmospheres may also be used in storage areas to reduce degradative processes. For example, carbon dioxide levels are often elevated in the storage of apples to reduce their respiration rates and slow spoilage. Non-thermal processing methods 
can be used in place of thermal processing methods to destroy microbial populations initially present without using heat which may damage sensitive products. Examples of these non-thermal processing methods include food irradiation, pulsed electric field applications, high pressure processing, and a number of others. This is the end of part one.